then, uh, hi everybody, you've seen the pre-show I guess now, so <laughs> we're gonna get started. Um, welcome to the last of uh, NCRI's summer webinar series. Um, it's been a really great summer with some really diverse uh, people, so um, thanks so much if you've been coming um, and keep an eye out for further webinars that we have planned in the future. Um, Lopka has been on our list since the very beginning and we're really excited to have her here. So um, yeah, really excited for the talk today. So we'll do it same as usual. Um, talk first, hold questions until the end or put them in the chat, um, please. Uh, unless you would like to do more interactive Lopka or what's better for you? Um, when I'm doing in-person presentations, I'm all for people raising their hands and, and answering questions, especially because some of the topics are a little convoluted so right. I don't quite know how that would work in the new setting it's, but a, it's a little bit difficult but the, if there's yeah. any places where you want to pause and solicit questions go for it yeah um, okay. but uh, but otherwise we'll keep it um, yourselves on mute and put them in the chat um, okay. and uh, okay so we would like to acknowledge our funders which are the Queen Foundation and the Region of Queens municipality we're very thankful for them uh, they made the summer webinar series happen um, and we would also like to acknowledge that we are meeting here virtually in Guestwick, uh, one of the seven districts of Mi'kma'ki, homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, we acknowledge the treaties of peace and friendship, and we thank the Mi'kmaq people for their generosity in sharing their homeland with us. Um, with that, I will give it over to you, Lopke. All right. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right. You should be able to see everything? Yeah, it's perfect. Great. All right, so uh, my talk today is going to be about freshwater acidification and aluminum, which is an ongoing problem in Nova Scotia. And in fact, it's in a, a lot worse of a problem in Nova Scotia compared to a lot of the other regions. So the work that I've been doing over the past couple of years has been partially to answer the question of why is Nova Scotia so special? Um, and so that's what I'm going to be presenting to you, to you here today. So let's, there we go. Okay, so first a little bit about me. Um, I am a water quality specialist. I'm in year five of my environmental professional training. Um, I am a um, environmental scientist and an earth scientist by training and I, I'm currently a researcher and the former lab manager at the Sterling Hydrology Research Group. And that's some of the photos that you're seeing here is um, some of the field work that I've been involved in. And some of it has been a little glamorous than others. The one down there at the bottom left in the wetsuit, that was not fun. That was, that was a very smelly march that we were doing. With. So the research that I'm going to present to you today is the culmination of the work that I've been doing along with all of the other members of the research group. And since this is in a bit of an unconventional um, setting, I decided to go with more of a, a storytelling approach instead of walking you through the exact methods for each research project that I did, because I figured that would get a little boring. So I'm going to give you first an overview of the aluminum threat. Um, so what kind of impacts it has both on our society and the environment. Um, let you know why Nova Scotia is a hot spot and also a little bit of more chemistry background on where this aluminum in our water is coming from and the importance of the different species of aluminum that there are. Then I'll get into actually answering the question of why is aluminum bad in Nova Scotia. So that includes talking about freshwater acidification, um, harvesting of our forests and climate change. And then lastly, I'm going to give you some idea of options that we have in terms of solving the aluminum problem. So first, um, this is a graphic that shows you all of the many negative impacts that aluminum has. So it has societal impacts by increasing the cost of water treatment, um, reducing our harvest yields when you do do forestry and causing a, a loss of fisheries revenue. And it impacts everything in the environment from the nutrient um, regulation within the waters to um, reducing aquatic invertebrate species richness to impacting fish and birds and amphibians and algae. And then um, that also carries over into our terrestrial ecosystems. 
So it reduces forest resilience and also reduces crop success. And so to get into a little bit more of the um, Nova Scotia relevant ecological impacts that there are. Um, so salmonids like um, brown trout and rainbow trout and salmon are especially sensitive to aluminum. And in Nova Scotia, the Atlantic salmon have been kind of the, the poster child of the species that have been um, adversely affected by this. So we've seen some of our populations declining by 88 to 99 percent. So they're just they've just been decimated. And um, aluminum uh, associate or elevated aluminum concentrations associated with freshwater acidification are a contributing threat to four of the species that are currently listed as endangered by Coastal. And so the way that aluminum is impacting the salmon specifically is it attaches to their gills. Their gills have a negative charge. And so aluminum has a positive charge or certain species of aluminum do. And so that means it binds to the fish gills and causes them to degrade, which essentially is causing the fish to suffocate. And there's a whole host of other associated problems like um, disrupted acid base balance that is then associated. Um, with that for the fish. And so, especially for the fish, we also need to consider the seasonal variability of aluminum. Um, because when there are certain life stages of the fish that are more sensitive to aluminum than other life stages. So for the Atlantic salmon, in our example, they're very sensitive when they are going undergoing smoltification. So they're kind of going into their teenage years as they transition from par to smolt. And that tends to occur in the spring. So we did one research project and one of the outcomes of that project is what you're seeing here. Um, so here we looked at the variability of aluminum throughout the year and that's what those graphs are there on the side. And so if you look at that top little graph, which has a green line, you see that there's a little spike that happens there in the spring. And so, rivers that have that type of pattern are um, indicated in green on the map. And so you see that in the Annapolis Valley and a little bit um, up along the coast of Halifax and then up further in, in Nova Scotia in the South River. These rivers are um, have, have an aluminum pattern throughout the year which is extra concerning for the fish. And aluminum doesn't just affect our ecosystems and our fish, it also impacts our society because inevitably our environment is tied in with our society and especially in a resource-based economy like we have in Nova Scotia, there's very direct impacts. So with loss of Atlantic salmon, we've also had a, um, an economic loss to the tune of $255 million and a loss of over um, 3,000 full-time jobs and 10,000 seasonal jobs. Um, and so there's the fishery side of things, but then there's also the forest side of things. So our trees are also negatively impacted by higher aluminum concentrations because it decreases their ability to take nutrients up out of the soil, which causes their growth to be reduced. And so because of that, we have trees like what we see in this picture here that are just stunted um, and they're just not growing as optimally as they could. And so as I've alluded to in the last couple of slides, Nova Scotia is absolutely a hot spot of increasing aluminum. We did a study of nearly 400 lakes and rivers across Europe and North America and we found that there are these really profound hot spots both in Sweden and in Nova Scotia where instead of about half of the sites having increase in aluminum trends like we see elsewhere, we have about 80% of our sites which have increasing aluminum concentrations. And so that's really concerning, especially as our Atlantic salmon populations continue to, to decline. And um, also because our forests next to those rivers are already in really bad shape. So you might be wondering, where is that aluminum coming from? So the aluminum that we see in our rivers starts out in our rocks. So aluminum is the most abundant metal in the Earth's crust. And so it's contained in these aluminosilicate minerals. 
Um, so for example, potassium feldspar, it's a really pretty pink little rock and you see it in a lot of the granites um, around Keji, um, the middle of Nova Scotia area. So as those rocks are weathered down and formed into soils and clays, the aluminum is um, made available. And then during the process of soil formation, you have this redistribution of aluminum throughout the soil. And so if you look in this picture here in the, the subsoil, the, that kind of brownish range where you also have the accumulation of iron, you have the highest concentrations of aluminum. And so once it's in the soils, it's potentially able to enter our rivers. And so there are these three different mechanisms as to how aluminum can be mobilized out of the soil and wind up in our river. And all of, or most of these processes are based on pH. So if our soils are acidic, um, that increases the amount of aluminum that's being taken out of those soils and washed into the water. And in addition to acidity being a main factor, there's also um, the concentration of ligands, which is an important factor. So ligand is a chemistry term, which means just anything that will bind together with a different molecule, so in our case, aluminum. And so the main ligand that we have in Nova Scotia, which will bind to aluminum, is organic carbon. So whenever you're seeing water that's just really brown and dark, that's got a lot of organic carbon in it and so potentially also has higher concentrations of aluminum. So once aluminum is washed out of the soil and into the river, it can change speciation. And that's something that we need to account for because um, certain species of aluminum are more toxic for aquatic health. So all of the positively charged species of aluminum can more easily bind with fish gills, for example. And so those are the ones that we are more concerned about. So we did this other study, which you see some of the results of here in this map, where we were looking at the most toxic forms of aluminum, which are those positively charged forms. And we see, as you can tell by all of the red and orange, that it's not, it's not good news for Nova Scotia. Um, so we are using here the threshold of 15 micrograms per liter. So just the tiniest amount of aluminum um, is, if, if there's more aluminum than that in the water, you start to see negative effects on fish, especially during those sensitive life stages that I was talking about earlier. And so there's um, our sampling site that I was talking about earlier up in, in Sheet Harbor. The, that's really an area where there's very pronounced problems, but also in Keji, in just Mersey River and Pine Martin Brook, there are um, just high percentages of the samples that we're taking are exceeding those guidelines. And so it's really something that we should be concerned about in Nova Scotia. So, so far, I have shown you that aluminum threatens ecosystem and societal health in Nova Scotia. So now on to the next part, which is why. So here we're getting into a little bit of the fancy soil chemistry. So there are four different mechanisms through which aluminum export from soils can be increased. It can either be increased by increasing the acidity of the soil water, by decreasing the amount of base cations, so calcium and magnesium in the soil, by increasing the amount of ligands, so things like dissolved organic carbon, as I was talking about before, and by decreasing the reaction time. So when there is acid deposition, it needs to be buffered. And so let me talk about acid deposition for a little bit. So freshwater acidification, which is the main cause of the increased aluminum concentrations in Nova Scotia, is defined as decreased freshwater pH and acid neutralization capacity and an increased concentration of aluminum and acid anions. And so the reason our waters in Nova Scotia are acidified and our aluminum concentrations are high is because we receive a lot of acid deposition. So acid deposition is caused by the combustion of fossil fuels and metal smelting. So this will emit um, nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide up into the atmosphere. Once it's in the atmosphere, it will turn into an acid when it combines with the water. 
and then you have what we all know as acid rain, which the scientific term for is acid deposition. So with that acid deposition coming down onto the soils, you start washing out all of these base cations, all of the calcium and magnesium gets washed out of the soil into the water. And eventually the calcium and the magnesium in the soils runs out. So then aluminum starts getting washed out of the soils and that's what we're seeing in Nova Scotia. So how this has developed through time is the whole issue of the acid rain crisis was first really identified in the 1970s and 1980s. And then in response to this crisis, um, governments across Europe and North America implemented several different pieces of legislation which limited the emission of those sulfur and nitrogen oxides, so those compounds that were causing the acid rain. And in response to that legislation, um, there were decreases in acid deposition. And that's what you're looking at in this little graph here. So these are several different rivers across Nova Scotia. That's the, those are the numbers on the um, vertical axis. And those different colors demonstrate the pH ranges of those rivers through time. So if you look at the bottom, you see how the pH has changed from 1920 up until what is projected to be in um, 2025. And so where you see that red right in the middle around the 1980s, that is when the acid rain crisis was at its worst. Any river that you see here that has that red bar in it, that the pH got so low there that Atlantic salmon were extirpated from those rivers. They were not able to survive anymore. Any of the orange range is where the um, adult fish were having troubles. Um, the yellow range is where some of the young fish would have started dying, so the most sensitive fish. And the green range is where um, the fish would have not been having too many troubles. So the reason why acid rain is actually a problem in Nova Scotia, even though we don't really have a huge amount of actual emissions happening in Nova Scotia, um, is because of the jet stream. And that's what you're seeing here in this little video from NASA. Um, this, is, this was made a while ago, like back in the 1980s, and this is just one month of the jet stream. And so what you can see with that red and yellow swirl that's happening, it's carrying everything from the eastern coast of the USA up to Nova Scotia. And so we have this unlucky nickname in Nova Scotia as being the tailpipe of North America because most of the emissions that are happening in North America pass over Nova Scotia on their way out to the ocean and so this is why Nova Scotia actually receives quite a bit of acid rain even though we don't have that much coal burning happening in Nova Scotia anymore. So after that legislation was implemented, there were significant reductions of sulfate deposition. And that's what this little trend line is here. That's the deposition right near Keji. So you see that the amount of acid rain that we've been receiving has steadily declined since the 1980s. But if you look at this map over on the right hand side, we are actually still receiving more acid rain than our soils can handle. So in this map, Everywhere where the color is not green, we are still receiving more acid deposition than can actually be buffered by the calcium and magnesium in our soils. And so this is referred to as um, deposition in excess of the critical loads. And so the reason this is still a problem, even though there have been those reductions in acid rain, is because our bedrock weathers very, very slowly and does not actually contain a lot of base cations. So for any of you that are familiar with the, the granite types of bedrock, it, they're just, it takes a lot of time for that to weather down to the point that there's actually new base cations coming out of that rock. So since everything in Nova Scotia is so bad, we actually have a unique opportunity to use it as a case study because it is so chronically acidified um, and um, Environment and Climate Change Canada has actually been monitoring Nova Scotia since the 1980s. So throughout all of this time where Nova Scotia has been so acidified, we can actually look at the water chemistry and see how that's happened 
how that's um, changed through time. And so we've been using this data to answer the question, um, do lakes and rivers recover from freshwater acidification in the way that we would expect them to? And so we did three different studies. Um, so one was on the seasonal variability of aluminum, one was on the speciation of aluminum, and then the last one was on the trends of aluminum. And from the results of these three studies, we discovered that the answer to our question was no. Our lakes and our rivers are not recovering as we would expect them to. So this is a bit of a complex graphic, and I'd like you to focus mainly on the last pane all the way over on the right side. So that's showing how we would expect freshwater acidification to um, resolve itself once acid deposition or acid rain has decreased. So we would expect a simultaneous and rapid increase of both base cations, so calcium and magnesium, and also dissolved organic carbon. And as a result of that, an, a decrease in our aluminum concentrations. And so instead of seeing this, which we actually see in many sites in Europe and the USA, we see this. It's a tiny, tiny change, but instead of our calcium recovering very quickly, as was projected by all of these models that were developed earlier, we actually see no or very, very slow recovery of the base cations in our soils. And what this means is that aluminum is continuing to be washed out every time we have rain because there is still some uh, sulfate and nitrate in our rain. And so we are continuing to just wash this aluminum out of our soils and into our rivers. And since there is still deposition in excess of what our soils can actually handle, this problem is not going to resolve itself. So to tie it back to those four little processes that I showed you earlier, these two that I've highlighted are the main ways that we, um, that we think, or the, main, the two main reasons that we think aluminum is still a problem in Nova Scotia. So we just don't have a lot of basic cations in our soils. And in response to acid deposition, or reductions in acid deposition, there's been a very rapid increase in these complex and ligands. So this dissolved organic carbon, which is attaching to the aluminum and washing it out into the water. And so in addition to freshwater acidification, we have two other main drivers of aluminum in Nova Scotia. One of them being our um, unsustainable forest harvest. So as you all know, um, we like clear cutting in Nova Scotia. That is um, a very efficient way of removing base cations from our ecosystem. So as trees grow, they're taking up this calcium and this magnesium into their stems and into their branches and leaves. And then when, and then um, when you cut those trees down and remove those trees from the ecosystem, you're effectively taking that calcium and magnesium off of the land and it's not going to be returning to the soils. And so this process is very pronounced when you're doing whole tree harvest in, this, uh, in the way that you would do when you're using it for biomass um, energy generation, because then there's absolutely all of the parts of the tree are being taken away, the small branches, the leaves, everything. So all of the calcium that's been taken up by this tree is not being returned to the soil. So this worsens the aluminum problem by taking more of the calcium out of the soil. In addition to that, climate change is probably going to make the problem worse for us because when temperatures are higher, there's more microbial activity in soils. So there's more little microbes breaking down all of the organic matter and creating more organic carbon, which then will bind to the aluminum and wash it out into the water. In addition to that, they are predicting that um, we're going to have more intense rainfalls. And so when there is more heavy rainfall, there's a lot more water landing on the soil all at once and it's being washed out very quickly. And so there's not a lot of time for this slightly acidic rain to be buffered. And so that again will continue to wash base cations out of the soil and keep them from replenishing themselves. 
and will also wash additional aluminum into our rivers. And that's what this picture is showing, is the, the projected changes in um, discharge from rivers, which is, is a proxy for the, the changes in precipitation. So to summarize all of that, um, the aluminum problem that we have in Nova Scotia is mostly caused by an unexpected ecosystem response where dissolved organic carbon is increasing very rapidly in response to decreased acid rain. But the recovery of base cations in soils has been very slow or doesn't exist in many areas. And so this problem is expected to worsen because of our unsustainable forest harvest and climate change. So what can we actually do about it? So starting with the most difficult way to actually solve the problem, um, is by changing policies and legislation. So the Clean Air Act amendments of the 1970s and the 1990s were very effective in reducing sulfate emissions, but they didn't really address the nitrate emissions. And so that continues to occur and hasn't really changed since the 1980s. And most of these are produced by transportation. So we would need more stringent emission controls on our cars to actually prevent that acid rain from happening in the first place. And there have been some studies trying to see what would happen if those emission controls were in place. And they actually warn us that if we become more efficient and have better rules for the emissions from our cars, there is a chance that people will start driving their cars more just because they're thinking like, oh, it's, it's not as bad. And so that's something that we need to keep aware of, but that is a small detail. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware of the Lazy Report. Um, following its guidelines would be a great way to um, prevent base cation losses from our soils. Specifically, um, it recommends that we don't do this whole tree clear cutting and remove all of the trees um, in most of the stands that we have. It recommends that we don't do any clear cutting in areas with thin soils. So anywhere in middle Nova Scotia would qualify. And then lastly, in plantation forests where they're continuously growing a forest and cutting it down, they are advising us to add base cations, so calcium and magnesium, back into the soil to actually prevent that depletion from happening in the first place. So those are more ways to actually address where the problem is coming from, which is the base cation depletion and the acid rain. Those are also more difficult changes to actually make. So some of the other changes that can be made is by adding base cations back into the soil. And this is kind of a more of a band-aid solution that we can be doing in the meantime while addressing those policy changes that do need to be made. So one of the options that we have is adding calcium and magnesium directly to the rivers using lime dosers, which you see a picture of here. Um, there has been a several year ongoing um, lime doser project up in uh, Sheep Harbor and they have found significant improvements in both water quality and the amount of young Atlantic salmon that they're seeing. So there's a higher return rate of the older salmon and they are actually spawning and surviving long enough for us to count them. So when you're adding calcium and magnesium to the rivers, it will inevitably get washed away and you continuously need to add those base cations in. So what else you can do is add it to the soils. And so we did another trial where we added the calcium and magnesium directly to the soils. And the way that we uh, did it was by lining, which means we were using calcium carbonate rocks. And so what you're seeing here in this graph is a comparison of the before and after for both of our control sites and our treatment sites. And what we see is that while the aluminum problem got worse in our control sites, it actually improved in our treatment sites. And so this is something that we are working on doing more. And it's, it's a little bit difficult to explain, so I thought it might be easier to just show you a video of how it actually works.
So that big bucket that you see is what dangles under the helicopter because the way we usually apply the base cations is by dumping them out of the helicopter onto the soil because it's just really difficult to get in under the trees. So we have this front end loader, which will put the limestone in there and this brown dust, what you're seeing, that's the limestone that we used. And so the helicopter is now gonna lift off and take this bucket with it. And so they were trying to be very efficient with their, um, with their turnaround time. So while the helicopter is flying off, the, the scooper is getting some more limestone. And so here you see the helicopter coming back for another load. And so what actually happens is the helicopter will take off with this bucket of limestone dangling under it. It will fly to the watershed where we're applying the calcium and magnesium to. And there's this little hatch at the bottom that will open and just it flies by and you see this like stream of limestone come out. And that's how we apply it. We're working on um, designing a, a, a different way of applying it as well, where we're going to be using skitters um, to apply it after a clear cut to try and help those young trees grow up as fast as we can and for those young trees to also be healthier. And so if you watch here, he's soon gonna open the buckets and there goes the limestone. And so this is usually a half week operation to do a small watershed. And so they will go back, get more limestone, and just do these several passes across the watershed to actually get the limestone everywhere on the soil. And they've been doing this type of liming in um, Norway and Sweden for quite some time. And there they've found that the effects are quite long lasting. So you can do this one application of the limestone and you will see effects of it for 50 years down the road. Now, of course, it won't stay as effective as it was um, when you first applied it for those whole 50 years, but you do actually see a very long-term improvement of the water quality. So to just summarize, um, high and increasing aluminum concentrations threaten Nova Scotian ecosystems. These concentrations that we have are so high because there is an increase in dissolved organic carbon and virtually no change or even a decrease in calcium concentrations in response to reduced acid rain. Um, climate change and unsustainable forestry exacerbate this problem. And we are able to solve this problem by um, sustainably managing our forests, creating policy change, and using these base cation amendments, which I just showed you. And so quickly before I hand the microphone, I guess, back over to Emma. Um, I'd like to thank everyone who's been involved in these projects. So that includes my supervisor and my supervisory committee, um, all of the agencies who collected and contributed the data that we used, all of my assistants who did water quality sampling with me, and of course, our very many funders. And so I hope I didn't lose you in that whirlwind of information. Um, I would love to answer any questions that you have. Alrighty, thank you so much, Lavka. Um, I would uh, invite anyone who would like to pose a question to just, I've muted everybody, but if you want to take yourself off booth mute, we'll take um, first come first serve, and then uh, if you'd like to go next, some, put something in the chat. That works for everybody. Any questions? Hi, this is Sarah Tuziak with DFO. Um, Maritimes region. I just had a quick question about the, I guess, I don't know if you know the answer to this or if anything's been done, but what is the long-term feasibility of liming um, soil, aquatic environments? Like, I, I guess it's probably a multifaceted question, but I'm just wondering, um, like financially and just Resource-wise, what's the feasibility of continuing to do this? Is it is it feasible? Is it actually going to help? Um, yeah, yeah. It's it's a very good question um, because, as you imagine, um, flying around helicopters is not very cheap. Um, so at this point in time, um, we are at least with the helicopter lining, 
trying to aim it toward strategically choosing watersheds which would benefit the most from it. And so for us specifically, we would be looking at watersheds where there is still a viable Atlantic salmon population and just trying to improve those spawning grounds um, because it's not feasible to line the entire province. So that, um, and in addition to that, we're also looking to reduce the financial costs and try to broaden the areas where it might be applicable to. So for example, since forestry is, the, the trees here are just in such dire need of base cations, um, we're trying to develop a mechanism where we can use like a skitter or just something that's you can just drag along the ground to um, apply this limestone um, after a clear cut because at that point you can actually access the soils where you otherwise wouldn't just because everything is so small and like growing so close together. So um, it's not feasible to do it for the entire province and we need to be strategic about where and when we apply it and while we're working on ways to um, try to make it a little bit cheaper. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, is there any questions from anybody else? I just wanted to share a thought. This is John Sullivan. I've been involved with water quality monitoring on the Carlton River and other bits and pieces of the Tuscan catchment over the last number of years. Most of it in response to blue-green algal blooms and remember the tales of the mink farms up in um, uh, Digby County that had downstream effects and all the rest of it. We've been noticing um, uh, hotter, drier summers, and I guess climatologists are predicting we're going to have more of them. Um, there's a strong association between hot, dry summers and lower color levels in the water, which might mean uh, it'd be an indicator of lower organic carbon levels. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, it's, it's another sort of aspect of maybe a link between climate change and how this might affect, uh, sounds to me like possibly aluminum. Uh, yeah. Um, so is, is it mostly lakes or rivers that you're monitoring? Uh, we monitor lakes. Okay, so the mechanisms in lakes and rivers are a little bit different. Um, so I have been dealing mostly with lakes, but I, I actually had the pleasure of this morning discussing it with, um, with Andrew from a Nova Scotia environment. I know him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I figured you would. Um, yeah, so what we see in rivers is when, um, it kind of, there's there's high concentrations of organic carbon during the summers just because there's less water so the concentration will inevitably go up and then um, once it starts raining again once it starts getting a little bit wetter during those first rains there's a lot of organic carbon that gets washed out into the river and then after that first flush it calms down a little bit shall we say and then you see a little bit less high concentrations during high flow and so that's that's a, a pattern that we see uh, also reflected in the aluminum in a lot of the um, the watersheds that we the rivers that we studied in southwest nova um, we see a spike of aluminum right when those first fall flushes are occurring in like okay. late summer early fall and then it kind of decreases and levels off again Good enough. <laughs> Thanks. Perfect. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. And open up the floor to anybody else. Hi, Lotka. Thanks Hi. very much. That was super interesting. Um, I just had a question. Do you know of any research that's been done anywhere about like debarking? I understand there's lots of calcium in the bark of trees stored in the in the bark of trees and I I remember hearing that in Europe they had tried debarking as a way of leaving some calcium on forest sites I wondered if that's any any research has been done and how that would uh, I I think you have to have purpose-made machinery but whether that would be you know kind of more long-term um, cheaper that's, than a helicopter that's a, that's a really good question um, I'm, I'm not an expert on trees 
Um, and as far as I know, they have not done any studies on that. Um, the only other studies besides like the lining studies that our, our lab is involved with um, that I really know that are trying different techniques is um, Kevin Keyes from uh, Lands and Forestry was trying to see if wood ash might help um, because of course that contains calcium as well. Um, I haven't heard about any results of that study so far. Um, it'd be very interesting to look at these these other types of techniques, but again, I'm I'm, I'm I do water quality and not not forest health as much, and so I'm I'm not as aware of the, the developments there. That's okay, thank you. I just wondered if you'd heard of anything. I remember seeing a paper a long time ago, but okay. but thank you. Sorry. Tom, I can see you talking, but we can't hear you. You could always type in the in the chat on the side, and then um, I could answer your question that way. Yeah, he's not muted. That's no, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and so the, the overview that I gave today is, uh, I find a little rushed. Um, it's, it's four years of research crammed into 40 minutes. Um, and so if, if anyone's uh, interested in any of the studies that I kind of briefly mentioned, um, I'd be happy to discuss them in more detail. Even if we adopt late-age recommendations, what is the long-term prognosis? Very good question. So there was a study done by Tom Clare and his colleagues where they tried to model how um, freshwater acidification, um, so pH and calcium concentrations would develop over time. So they did not look at aluminum specifically, but we can kind of infer what would happen with aluminum based on the research that they did do. And um, based on their models, it's not going to recover in on ecologically relevant timescales. So a lot of the rivers would not be returning to natural like pre-acidification conditions for the next hundred years. And based on the research that we have done so far, um, it might not be possible for some rivers to be returning to their natural state within uh, decades because the, the replenishment of the base cations through natural weathering and, and deposition from the atmosphere is just incredibly low. So following Leahy's recommendations and some of the other um, options that I mentioned today um, would almost be preventing it from getting worse as opposed to helping it get better. Okay. Any other questions? Always. You can hear the brains whirring just in case <laughs> there's any final pressing questions. Um, okay, I'm going to do a last call. Alrighty. Um, then I'm going to say thank you so, so much, Lavka, for doing this for us. This is a fantastic talk. Um, I'm going to get the, get it uh, uploaded on the YouTube channel this week, so I'll send you the recording once that's available. Um, okay. Everybody else, thanks for coming. Um, and uh, this is the end of the summer seminar series, so uh, stay in touch. We'll, we'll let you know about, about upcoming events um, by, uh, on our Facebook page and uh, through our email newsletter. Yeah. Thank you everyone for your attention. Perfect. Okay. Bye. Have a great Thursday. <laughs>